everyone and welcome to this conversation. So I'm going to go straight in and say that Sammy Martinen isn't your typical serial European founder story. He doesn't have one or two startups under his belt before this one. He has a whopping 13. Now he's on his 14th and apparently it's been going pretty well. Swappy has raised 170 million to date and it's nearing profitability, he told me before. So Sammy, is number 14 the one? Yeah, is it slush today? Like, uh, does the snow usually get your shoes wet this time of the year? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is the one, um, for sure. And, uh, and, and I mean, like, after, after trying out a lot of business ideas and a lot of things, like, uh, you learn to, like, recognize some patterns and you learn to, like, understand, like, uh, consumer behavior. Um, and when I got scammed buying a used phone, phone online back in the days, um, we realized really quickly after doing a consumer survey following that on the next day that like uh, this, this market can become like as big as the used cars. Like this can eventually be a 50-50 a market. And that's what we are driving towards and, uh, and that's what the Swappy's business model is, is, is solving. So why exactly did you choose to focus so narrowly on iPhones and phones and not a broader set of devices like a few, few others in the market have? Yeah, so, so when we did, the, when we did this, con this consumer survey back in the days, uh, we realized that yeah, over half the population would be ready to buy their devices as used or refurbished, but the market was only 5% back in, back in uh, late 2016. And the biggest barriers for people not purchasing are around not trusting the quality, like uh, not trusting that the phones work, not trusting that the batteries work, uh, not trusting the players on the market, and that was the biggest issue. Um, and of course, like then when, when people make the decision to buy, like it's also about price and some other factors. Um, and when, so, so given this, we knew that we need to, like, uh, we need to actually get the quality part right, and we need to get the price quality ratio right in this market if we really want to win. And iPhones account for like half of the market, so just listen to the consumers there and decided to actually focus on winning one category, becoming the most efficient player in the world in one category, automating our operations, our factory around that, and uh, yeah, rather than being okay in many. So it's just about focus and prioritization. And now that you've grown so much, would you ever broaden that? Is it about starting with a narrow focus and then broadening it, or are you just going to continue doing what you're doing and focus on broadening markets-wise. Yeah, so the iPhone. So, so the thing is that there are there are still a lot of markets to expand to. Uh, we can still multiply our like uh, business like uh, just by growing the existing markets up deep. There are multiple new markets to expand to in Europe, outside Europe, and the iPhone category um, is still the fastest growing category in the refurb smartphone sector. So we need to keep a tight focus. Um, and make sure that we are where we want to be, like uh, in terms of like uh, automating our processes and uh, and winning every single market we enter. So it will come eventually, but not in the near future. You mentioned earlier that what customers really cared about and were worried about was the quality, and I understand that this is sort of your USP that you do the quality control in house. Why did you choose to sort of handle that all yourself? Because it's a lot more work. Um, has it paid off? Yeah, it's it's definitely difficult, and in the beginning, like uh, it's it's much like uh, harder to scale, right? Like uh, when it, when you're working with an integrated business model, um, but it's it's definitely paid off. So our margins are significantly better. Our return rates are much lower than than basically for the players not handling that in house. Um, so it shows, it shows in referral rates and customers coming back. And in the end, you need to be really obsessed about the customer. You need to build everything around that. And we just felt in the beginning that we could, we cannot do this well enough for the quality piece or the margin piece. Like, uh, if we, like, uh, if we would go with an, with, a, with another business model. And on the margin piece, is that because ultimately, after having developed your own tech, you're saving costs without having to outsource to others? Yeah, exactly. When you control the full value chain, like from purchasing the devices from the market, you basically get thickest margin upside, right? Like, uh, and then if you're the most efficient player in processing the devices, you can actually extract it. 
and we are selling everything through swapi.com straight to the consumers. So there are like uh, no other inefficiencies, no middlemen or no, no other parties in the value chain. So for me, the really, really fascinating thing when we were speaking um, before was the 13 companies that you went through before Swappy. And I was a bit confused. I was asking, have you incorporated 13? Were they all real startups? Can you tell me a little bit about that story? Um, how many years was it? Were they all separate incorporated companies? Or were you just pivoting? What happened there? Yeah, good, good question. I was actually about to correct you in the beginning <laughs> on this one because, like, uh, we we actually ran like uh, 13 different business ideas under the same company, and we just did like uh, quick pivots. Um, and the thing thing here was that like uh, I had been looking for a co for another founder for years uh, back in the days, and when I met Yeri, the other company founder, I just knew that hey, like uh, this is it. Like I just need to leave everything else behind. I need to leave. We we need to quit our consulting summer jobs and just starting, start building stuff. And we had a long list of ideas and, and, the, and the kind of like rationale why we went there was that like, uh, we want to maximize our learning and find what we actually want to do. And even if we would fail, like, uh, we would learn faster than anywhere else. And we, have, we maximize the likelihood of actually finding what we want to do. So yeah, uh, it was 13 pivots, uh, a couple of like uh, smaller exits. We always used the money into building the next ones. So we basically bootstrapped for for a couple of years and eventually ended up founding Swappy. And uh, we we wouldn't have ever became the fastest growing company in Europe from 2017 until end of 2021 if we didn't have this background. And we couldn't have ever even probably even realized the the, the market. So. To clarify there, did you sort of self-fund whilst you were going through those 13 ideas? Um, and my second question related to that is, if you'd taken VC money, would you have gone through that process? Did that open up the freedom because you were able to self-fund? Yeah, so, so in the very beginning, we were just living off our low, like uh, basically off our student loans and off our savings. So we didn't, didn't take any salary for the, for the first couple of years. It was just for the love of the game and just for learning and, you know, finding our, finding our path. And we used all the basically income we got from the companies into like, you know, growing those and building the next ones uh, and next ones. Um, after like, funnily though, like we, we were not looking for funding, but like after like seven months or so of doing this, uh, we just randomly met, met, uh, met a guy like, uh, who, uh, who was uh, in one like very early stage fund uh, as an EIR. Like, uh, and he, he asked us what would we do differently if we had like uh, 50k of like more of cash. So then, then we thought about it and like uh, decided that hey, like we would just like accelerate the testing phase. So they actually liked what we do, how our approach, like what our approach was into, like uh, testing things with the consumers, uh, into just building businesses in general, and they invested into us as a team. So that was it. So 50k for the first three years. Okay, great. And then that sort of gave you a bit of pressure to really hunker down and make this number 14 the real one. It did, <laughs> and we we just didn't want to raise before we would actually find what we really want to push, like, uh, push forward globally. What was the biggest sort of failure along the way of those 13 or, or the biggest sort of learning that you took away from those? Was there one that you did pour more money into than others? Um, yeah. We had to be really, really frugal on cost as we were not like uh, paying salaries to ourselves. And uh, we, we were basically spending everything, like everything we got like uh, on the business. Um, yeah, so I guess the frugal mindset and kind of like uh, learning to invest wisely, like well, that's one of the biggest learnings. And, and I would say like uh, probably like uh, how do you like uh, how you need to be customer, like really obsessed on the customers. You cannot be fall, like, fall too much in, into love with your own ideas. You need to stay really humble and just like uh, try to understand deep down what are the drivers for the customers? Why are they buying in this market? What are their barriers of not purchasing? You need to build your whole business and your brand around it and your whole business model around it in order to really solve the biggest problems in the world. So that's, I guess, that's the like, single biggest learning. Of course, like, besides that, I learned to 
for example, <laughs> I learned to build a wall for our for, for our <laughs> store. We had this like uh, we're we're selling everything online today, uh, but we had this like uh, small store in the beginning, which was also our first office, and we couldn't get a contractor to uh, build the wall. It was like uh, too impossible, like 11 meter high space, etc. Uh, you couldn't support it anywhere, so I watched some YouTube videos and built it myself over the weekend. So, yeah, I learned some really random things. Learned basics on 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 coding. Uh, learned to deliver uh, deliver phones to customers' doors on a bike uh, on a slushy winter night. This all sounds very sort of bricks and mortar IRL compared to most of the tech software startups we're yeah. interviewing. In terms of all those pivots. When you did go to investors, and especially when you sort of went to, to VCs for sort of your later rounds, um, is that something that they asked you a lot about? And, and was it a negative at first? Did you have to sort of convince maybe your early investors that you really were going to focus on this and you weren't just going to carry on pivoting? Was that, did it sort of serve against you or for you? I think it definitely served for us that we had we had basically like uh, pushed the first three years with basically no money and uh, and we sold our previous company to basically fund the first year of uh, Swapi and we got Swapi off the ground from like uh, zero to half a million of net revenue during the first what like uh, nine months on the first year so I think like. That, that spoke for itself and, and the investor really liked our approach and how like uh, customer focused we are and, and liked our mission and, and kind of like the environmental focus. So that's with Swapi why we did why we also decided to leave the previous business behind. Like besides making this like besides our mission of making this category mainstream and making it as common as, as buying a used car. Um, yeah, the environmental side is just too big to ignore. So that was that was a clear so it wasn't sort of a lot of founders tell me that sort of pivoting is a little bit stigmatized in Europe when compared to the US. And I was wondering whether you sort of found that at all. Yeah, I have to agree that in, in Europe in general, especially if you look at the public audience, like uh, we, we were getting a lot of questions. Like uh, also here, we were getting a lot of questioning, like, uh, like, hey, like, what are you doing? Like, uh, start, like, get a real job. And like, uh, these guys are like trying their like 12th idea in a, in a couple of years already. Like, uh, but I think, like, I think that's changing, at least in Finland, the whole like uh, startup ecosystem, the whole thinking about entrepreneurship is changing super rapidly. So we were basically like uh, probably in the second wave of entrepreneurs after like uh, the success stories of like Supercell and, and Walt, uh, Rovio in the, in the early days, um, in 2010s. Um, and, and basically, like uh, I remember when we were asked, for example, in, in back in university, like uh, over ten years ago, like we were asked in our first class, like how many of you want to be an entrepreneur in general? Like uh, I think there were like three or four hands, like up out of like two hundred and thirty. Um, oh. And these days, it's like one third of the people. So, so kind of like the attitudes ad attitudes are changing quickly and i think also the stigma around pivoting is is changing at least here but it mm -hmm. it still exists in europe and i think it's still very different to for example uh silicon valley and uh what 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 companies do in y combinator etc it's a huge difference and in terms of founding a company in such a small market were you, I mean, you said backstage that you're now in 13 markets. How fast did you scale into those? Were you thinking about that from the get-go? Um, what were the challenges there and how fast did you scale? Yeah, so if you come from a small country like Finland, you have to think global from the get-go. You have to think global from day one. And that was the thing with our previous businesses. That was the thing with Swapi. So the first year we like uh, focused only in, in Finland. Right after after found like uh, finding product market fit during the first year, like uh, then we straight up after our first financing round went to Sweden and then to Italy. And uh, after getting the kind of like uh, three different sized markets working, that's when we decided to make the decision to scale further markets and open open ten uh, during the next couple of years. Okay, so really, really fast then. Yep. And, and do you think that was absolutely key for sort of surviving and, and standing up to your competitors? 
No, I don't think it was key to surviving. Like, I think I, can, I think it was more just about that, like uh, getting the first mover advantage. We were really early in the market. Uh, we have a winning business model, so we can we basically have thicker margins than our competitors in the space. Uh, better control of the kind of like uh, price quality ratio in general. So like uh, not expanding when you when you get the model to work would have been kind of like foolish in my opinion. So so we so wanted to push it as quickly as we could. Like uh, once we got the next next batch working, like uh, then immediately launching launching the next one. And I mean like that made made a lot of sense. That made total sense in in the environment we were in. Would you would you ever plan on going you know further field out of, outside of Europe? Um, do you feel like you would you, you would be too late, or is that something you consider? We're definitely not too late. So we have a we have a good head start in Europe. We are the largest player in Europe in refurbished iPhones, uh, and we are now kind of like uh, doubling down on our competitive advantages here. So building further on efficiency, and then one day. Definitely going outside here once we're ready. Okay, cool. There's still a lot of work here before that. Yeah, and you said that you, you know, consumer, consumer focus and constantly asking your consumers what they need. And we know that the different attitudes towards the climate crisis in Europe versus other markets. First of all, in the markets you're currently in, there has been so much more awareness in the last six years since you were founded. How have you managed that in your business? And how have you sort of scaled to meet that demand? Yeah, so there definitely has been a big change. Although, like, before I answer the question, I have to say, like, uh, it hasn't been fast enough. So, like, uh, e-waste, electronic waste is the fastest growing waste stream in the world, and it's expected to remain so for the next 10 years. So uh, there's 60 million like uh, metric tons of uh, electronic waste in 2023, 20, uh, and it's expected to grow to 75 million uh, by 2030, and, that, uh, and that's like equivalent to us throwing away like 1,000 laptops every second, and it's just too much. And and if you think about it, like uh, like 66 percent of Europeans do not resell or recycle their old smartphones like majority of us keep our phones in the drawers and mm -hmm. and when you think like if when you think about like that combination like we need to move much faster on the positive note like this market is growing super quickly like uh, it has 4x over the over the last last 7 years uh, at the same time we have 400x in size uh, it's it's growing really quickly, and and 40% of Europeans are now buying more like uh, more used used goods versus five years ago. So we're not on the right track, but working on making that faster. Wow, yeah, those are depressing stats. Um, I am curious to ask you, in your consumer research, are you finding that people are more driven by their climate concerns or economic concerns when they're coming to refurb? Well, people like to say that they care more about the environmental concerns, um, and that's that's definitely true for younger, like uh, younger and younger segments that we see across the markets. But in general, like, like, uh, well, maybe not surprisingly to me, but like uh, the environmental drivers are not like in the top three, basically anywhere. So it's it's about price quality ratio in the big picture. Like people are not willing to pay a premium for a uh, refurbished for a refurbished iPhone versus a new product. And how about sort of in the last couple of years, as you know, inflation has gone up and up and up, and the cost of living crisis has that affected your sales? Yeah. So uh, now the difference between what has happened now uh, since last year. Uh, so last year, beginning of the year, like no big difference. Uh, like this market has been outgrowing the new new device market for the for the last last seven years, like uh, growing 4x. Um, but last year, from mid last year, when the in inflation started to rise and interest rates started to grow, like uh, we could we could we we started to see the biggest shift from new like people shifting from buying new devices to buying refurbished. And that's something that has continued this year even faster. Yeah, OK, that doesn't surprise so the me. Gap, yeah, the gap is now bigger than ever. So your market is just growing and growing and growing, essentially, yeah. Yeah, for what, sure. What about um, changing legislation? And I'm interested in when you 
been growing so fast, whether that was even a consideration when you were starting out, and then how much more time you have to spend on that um, as you've grown in these markets. Yeah, so so like uh, let me start with that, like that, like like legislation. Like uh, we didn't actually even, to be honest, we didn't even really think about it when we started the company that you would have to like uh, have public affairs and and you could actually like try to impact legislation in the beginning. But one, once we started growing, uh, once we started to follow like. Uh, like started being bigger across Europe and started to follow the right to repair legislation and, and other things like this, we, we noticed that actually no one in this industry is, is really working on it. So it's all basically um, lobbied and affected by new, like new smartphone and new electronics manufacturers. So even though EU wants to push for a circular economy, they didn't have anyone like advocating for the refurbished industry. It, 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 it basically, it's because this industry grew from, uh, from scratch uh, in a couple of years and, and no, one, no one was able to grow quickly enough to, to get the size that you, would, you, you could even invest there. And, and as, as we started to be one of the first ones, uh, we found it super important that we, that we start the work and that we start pushing the work for the industry and, and with the industry. Um, there are some bigger problems there, like uh, that, for example, in the past, past years, I think, as you mentioned in the beginning, like uh, the average European users like, uh, are using uh, their smartphones only for 2.8 years, and the lifespans have been, have been getting shorter from like uh, 10 to 15 years ago. And, uh, and the, and the uh, electronics have been getting less repairable, like harder to repair. Um, and basically, there are things like uh, software pairing for the for the smartphones. So, like uh, manufacturers are pairing, for example, batteries uh, like to the actual to the smartphones. So, if you change even two new batteries apart uh, or two new screens apart uh, with an iPhone, uh, they will not have all the functional elements anymore. So, the software is blocking that even for new parts. And this is happening with, new, with, with other manufacturers as well. And this is a really big issue. Like, like imagine like if you had for your car, imagine like uh, if you had a Toyota car and, and you could only, only change your like, uh, Toyota car tires in a Toyota, like, sorry, it, your car tires in a Toyota shop and you would have to pay like 2,000 euros for that. Like, otherwise they wouldn't work. Like that would be just silly. And, and this is like, if we don't do something about it, like that's, where this market is heading. So we've been working on this and, and, and actually have been getting the first wins. So, okay, great. so this, is, this is moving to the right direction. And for example, the battery part uh, that's like uh, looking to be banned by EU and, uh, and now, now there's a right to repair, repair legislation on going and, and, and it's moving to the same direction. So. And obviously, as a larger company, you have a little bit of an advantage there with, with, um, with lobbying and, and with, uh, with legislation. But would you advise founders who are sort of much earlier stage in the room to be trying to engage earlier on in that journey? Yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think it's hard. It really depends on the industry. So like for us, it's very critical that we also push for things like beyond just for Swapi. Like uh, for us, we, th we think about the whole refurbished electronics and use electronics industry. It's, it's, yeah, as it's the fastest growing waste stream in the world, it affects so many consumers. For us, it's been a kind of like a no brainer to work on it. Mm. Um, maybe for smaller companies, I would advise them to like join some unions and like uh, you know work with others. Um, for us, we have been needed there to drive the work with a couple of other companies, and besides, like uh, you know, representing the whole industri industry. And lastly, with the last minute, I want to just ask you the classic question of what would your biggest piece of advice be um, for founders in this room. I'm particularly fascinated by managing company culture through the growth that you've seen, but I don't know whether you want to touch on that or whether it's um, more, more on this um, product side, but yeah. Yeah, uh, good question. So what comes to managing the company culture, I would advise everyone to, everyone to have like uh, incentives for the, for the leaders, like not just on hard KPIs and role, like uh, hard performance on the roles, but also the people side. So everything about like uh, your culture, um, 
basically, uh, for example, for us, it's about growth mindset, impact, uh, having an inclusive culture. Um, and, and that gives you really good results long term. That's a really good tool to manage growth and ENPS at the same time so that you don't trade off either one. Last piece of advice would just be to like, uh, yeah, follow your like, uh, yeah, like really like uh, follow your mission uh, and really think about what's the mark that you want to leave to this world. Uh, be willing to change your business idea if that doesn't match your own ambitions there, like in what you what you actually want to leave behind, or or if it, if it doesn't match what the consumers really really want and. Try to be present and enjoy the ride. Amazing. Even changed 13 times. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for your time. Great. Thanks a lot.